For this episode of Dairy Business Update, we're pleased to be speaking with Krista Hardin, who is the relatively newly appointed CEO of the U.S. Dairy Export Council. She's based in Arlington, Virginia, um, and we're delighted to welcome her to the show. Krista, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Joel. I'm excited to be here. Uh, not that it matters too much to our viewers, but I happen to be speaking from World Dairy Expo, where I just heard your boss, Tom Gallagher, head of DMI, your parent organization, uh, say that uh, back in 1995, when U.S. DEC began, we were exporting less than 2% of our U.S. production, but today we're in the neighborhood of 17%. And then he went on to say that in uh, uh, the next 10 years, he thinks that number will be 25 to 30%, which got everybody's attention. <laughs> um, from all of that, uh, what do you see from your point of view as the most important factors to con contribute to that uh, export growth? Well, Joel, thank you for it. It's a great question. And I, I really think thinking about the numbers, how far we've come from that you know, 2%-ish um, getting closer and closer to 20%, even against headwinds, and which I'm sure we'll talk about through this, this conversation. But um, I believe there are a couple of factors that are in place. First of all, the opportunities are huge for us in U.S. dairy. About, you know, 4 or 5%, you know, 6% maybe of the world's population live in the U.S. So there's a lot of folks um, around the world who you know, need um, dairy protein or interested in having dairy part of their diet. They want a healthy, nutritious product that's produced sustainably, which we can provide them. So we know the demand is going to be there. And with, another factor is, as the demand grows, and I believe it will, the U.S. is positioned perfectly to take advantage of that. We have the resources, which land is one of them, frankly. Uh, we have the ability to increase um, production. Our farmers are so efficient, they're so impactful. We grow in production almost every year. So we know we can meet that demand around the world. So it's just putting all those factors together. Demand is there. We have the resources um, to meet that demand, a, a part of it, at least a good part of it. And I think there's a growing awareness among our, our farmer community and our cooperatives and our processors um, that this truly is a way for the U.S. dairy industry to continue to, to thrive, not just survive, but thrive. So I just, you know, we're building the infrastructure. There's some port issues we've got to, to talk about. I hope we'll get to today some other infrastructure issues. But if you're a young person saying, should I come back home to my family's dairy? What I would say to that young family is yes, 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 because of exports because what we can do, what we can be um, around the world. We, we need U.S. exports, um, you know, we, we need exports in the U.S. industry, but they need us too. So I'm excited about what's ahead. Well, that's great news. Now you just mentioned headwinds, you mentioned uh, port issues. Uh, we've heard that U.S. ports are jammed up logistically, uh, shortage of, of containers, uh, a number of logistical issues. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, there continues to be uh, wrinkles. Uh, the strength of U.S. currency can vary sometimes and be a challenge. Uh, what is US, U.S. DEC able to do to help uh, short term and perhaps longer term in terms yeah. of the headwinds? Thank you, Joel. I think you hit on it. There, there are short term issues and long term. First of all, to start with recovery of COVID around the globe, it's very, very uneven. We're, you know, I keep hoping we're getting ahead of it here in the U.S. We're having more and more folks vaccinated. Um, we have, you know, hopefully going in the right direction in that sense. The rest of the world, many cases, don't even have an availability of um, vaccines. Um, they're catching up, hopefully quicker. Um, but eating habits, you know, those kinds of issues really are varied across the globe. So that's something the recovery <laughs> to COVID has taken longer and it, it is uneven. So we've got to deal with that. The port issue, you know, I always say I'm a pretty good sleeper, but if anything wakes me up at night, it's about the ports. And if I wake up and that comes to mind, I have a hard time going back to sleep. Because when I talk to our members, they talk about those daily struggles. And frankly, it is a complex issue. There is no one answer, but I'll tell you that the influx of imports we have, 
coming in from Southeast Asia, particular in, in our West Coast um, ports, but it's also starting to hit our East Coast as well. We're importing more, so, it's to, so ships are waiting longer in port to get unloaded. That means, you know, do we have the infrastructure, the warehouses, the, the containers, the labor, all the things it takes to deal with more imports? And that after they've waited a long time, a container ship's waited a long time in port, they, you know, they see the clock a ticking and they want to do a quick turnaround and get back to bring more goods to the U.S. because we're buying more. It's, you know, thinking about holiday season already. Um, so sometimes it's cheaper for a tanker to leave empty than wait and get loaded with a U.S. product going out. And often that is an agriculture product, including dairy. So we're working so closely, Joel, with the White House, with Congress, with the Federal Mar Maritime Commission, with the ports themselves to talk about some short-term solutions that might alleviate some of these pressures. But we need, we need long-term answers too. We need infrastructure focus. We need to think about that supply chain all the way back to the farm and making sure we're getting products to processors and processors to port and then containers to get them um, to our customers around the world. I mean, we have demand. We have folks who want U.S. products. We have businesses with contracts they're trying to fill um, and we can't get product to them in a timely manner. So this that's the headway headwinds we're facing um, in dairy, and in spite of that, we're still exporting more than we have before. Um, but yet, this poor shipping infrastructure issue, we've got to tackle um, head on, frankly. Well, perhaps on a more positive note, you just mentioned the Southeast Asia and Asia as a source of uh, imported product to the U.S. Uh, but your figures and others we've seen show that Southeast Asia is a growing market for U.S. dairy. Uh, Tell us a little bit about uh, why do you think that is and, and what are some of the steps U.S. DAC is taking to uh, support that? Um, you know, I, I'll tell you that, you know, we our traditional largest market and one that we still rely on and have a great relationship with and is Mexico. You know, it, it's, it's nearby and it's been the kind of the first market um, of choice, I think, for a lot of exporters. But we also recognize we need to diversify where we're selling U.S. dairy. Um, there's growing interest um, in dairy protein as a part of a diet in many of the Southeast Asian cultures and countries um, using dairy and sports drinks and smoothies and infant formula, but using it even in their, in their cultural um, diets as well. So the demand is there and we recognize in our industry several years ago we can be a part of that. We can help fill that demand. And we um, actually created the U.S. Center for Dairy Excellence in Singapore. I mean, this is, you know, concrete, you know, mortar, that kind of um, presence there, a stake in the ground, if you will, to say U.S. dairy is very interested in Southeast Asia. Unfortunately, the center opened in the middle of COVID, so we have not taken fully advantage of it, but our members can use the test kitchen they can host events, they can bring customers in and talk to them face to face. You know, We know at some point, maybe not as much right now, but through at the recovery of COVID, we will. So that was a one big, I think, just very visible commitment to this, this market. From 2019 to 2020, our exports um, increased in this region by 36%. So we know that we, the, you know, the interest is there. We know the interest in high quality, great value, wonderful products um, are, you know, there is demand for that in this region. So it's really about making sure that we're there. And this is products like whey and lactose, but also cheese, it's other, it's powder, it's other, you know, ingredients that um, we see. And the last thing I'll say is, a lot of these countries are really the governments and the health officials are saying, you know, we really want to include more. We're recommending more dairy and dairy ingredients in their diets. You see that in China, increasing that per day, per day consumption recommendation. To those things are, are telling us other countries are recognizing what we already know in the U.S., that dairy is good for you. It's good, a really good part of a healthy and nutritious diet. And we, we think that's one reason we're so excited about what the growth potential is um, in Southeast Asia. Well, and I hope in future conversations, we can talk about some of the other markets too that you see as 
having good potential for, for U.S. dairy. But today we'll wind up and thank you very much. Uh, we're speaking with Krista Harden, the CEO of the U.S. Dairy Export Council. We appreciate you being with us, Krista. Thank you for taking time. Thank you very much. This is Joel Hastings for Dairy Business Update at dairybusiness.com.